we are entering into the core of the session. The first speaker today is Karl Steinitz, Emeritus Professor from Harvard University, Graduate School of Design, and also Honorary Professor at the uh, University College London, Center of Advanced uh, Spatial Analysis. Um, Karl has been, I believe, one of the main contributors in what we call nowadays geodesign in the last decade, the community interested in this uh, methodology approach to planning and design has been growing immensely. And Carl also is coordinating a network of over 250 universities around the world. And um, so Carl, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Very good. Okay, just hold on a second. Let me get myself settled. Move that over here. Right. I, I think that this is the problem. It's big, it's serious. It's definitely addressing global challenges for emergency contexts. And I think it's a design problem. Hold on a second, I need to. This is from a, a paper that came out about two weeks ago from the National Institutes of Health in the United States. This is global land use change between 1960 and 2020, which is exactly the year when I started teaching and right about now. And what you see is change, either singular or multiple, that is both natural processes and human processes, and it's not complete because it doesn't show change in the ocean or in the atmosphere. But this is basically part of the problem. But our students now are gonna face a worse problem. On the upper left is climate-driven habitat niche difference. Red means that the people are gonna consider moving on the upper right is fertility, which is dropping in parts of the world and radically increasing in parts of the world. In the lower left is water scarcity measured in months now. And in the lower right is the impact of three degrees Celsius change on estimated crop yields by 2050, where red is down 50% and green is potentially up 50%. The consequence of this, according to the uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences report from 2020 in America, is that about a billion and a half people, a billion and a half people will consider moving between now and 2070. And they're going to move from the red areas and want to move to the green areas. That's definitely analyzing global challenges in emergency contexts. The question is, how do you solve it? How do you deal with it? How do you even think about it? And it's my experience, at least, that what you have to do is think from global to local to global. You can't think top down and you can't think bottoms up. You have to think across size and scale. And there are differences and problems about that. The geographic sciences do very well at the global scale, and as it gets smaller, they do worse and worse. The design professions, planning, architecture, engineering, law, banking, all of them in design, they're offensive strategies, they're changing things. And they work very well at the local level, and they work less and less and less well at the bigger, bigger, bigger size, smaller scale, by the way, bigger size. The real issue and the way you can, you can hope to manage is if you can manage planning, which is a design profession, at major infrastructure to regional management. And it's this scale, which is necessarily a collaboration between the geographic sciences and their defensive strategies, the design professions and their offensive strategies, the people of the place, and information technologists. And my, my presentations are normally color-coded by these colors. And we start with a fundamental set of problems. And that is, neither the scientists 
nor the people of the place, nor the design professions speak the same language. And yet, and yet, the methodologies that have to be implied must involve collaboration and negotiation. Said another way, I don't think that the answer to the problems that the next generations are gonna face is a data problem. And I don't think it's a technological problem. I think it's a human understanding problem. And the starting position is that we don't agree with each other. There are precedents. There are four important precedents for, for this kind of thinking. Now, I need to make an editorial comment. The, 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 the American and Canadian, the North American academic traditions and the European ones are really quite different. We, we really work from different literature. It's remarkable when you're in both of these communities and you, and you read the front parts of doctoral thesis, what's being cited. Well, I'm, I'm citing what influenced me when I started. One is Buckminster Fuller, The World Game, 1961, a comprehensive informational resource database, yes. Educational simulation tool, yes. Help create solutions to the open population and uneven distribution of global resources, yes. Herbert Simon, The Sciences of the Artificial, 1969. The natural sciences are concerned with how things are. That's really important. Even projection is important. Design, on the other hand, is concerned with how things ought to be. Secondly, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Norbert Wiener, in his book on cybernetics, collaboration requires two things, a framework for collaboration, in other words, a strategy for thinking about it, and a basis for communication. And that is shared knowledge, shared assumptions, and most importantly, a shared language. And his work influenced Herbert, uh, basically Marshall McLuhan, who talked about the medium. The media are the technologies that allow people to send messages to professionals and scientists and designers, lawyers, governments. They have to be able to talk to each other and they have to then send a medium back to the people who make these decisions. And so this level of communication in a shared language among people who don't agree and who speak different professional languages is central, central to thinking about and solving global issues. And finally, Kevin Lynch, my mentor, I was his first doctoral student from his book, A Theory of Good Urban Form. And this is how you should think about it in his view. And I happen to agree. It should connect values of very general and long range importance to that form and to immediate practical actions about it. It should be able to deal with plural and conflicting interests and to speak for absent and future people. It should be appropriate to diverse cultures and to variations in the decision situation, the centralization of power, stability, homogeneity, the level of resources, the rate of change. It should be sufficiently simple, flexible, and divisible that it can be used in rapid, partial decisions with imperfect information by lay persons who are the direct users of the places in question. It should be able to evaluate the quality of state and process together as it varies over a moderate space of time, and by the way, and space. While at root, a way of evaluating settlement form the concept should suggest new possibilities of form. In general, it should be a possible theory, not an iron law of development, but one that emphasizes the active purposes of participants and their capacity for learning. Those were important ideas. The generic problem as I see it is how do we organize and conduct, not just study and research, but how do we organize and conduct the very beginning and strategic stages of designing for longer term change in a large, multi system, multi client, relatively unpredictable and contentious context, and one which should not become a zero sum game. And this is very frequently the situation for important and complex projects and studies. 
Geodesign changes geography by design, by purposeful action. Why geodesign and why negotiation? Because when fundamental conditions are changing, and they are, and big database models predict future problems, and they are, the end game of our work still requires a purposely designed spatial temporal strategy for future action, and this is necessarily a political process. Geodesign is serious. It is most useful at the beginning of thinking about and deciding on the strategy of what to do. It does not normally produce a precise final product. Rather, the product is it could or should be something like this. Geodesign is dynamic. It combines system-based policies and projects. Geodesign must rapidly move from infinite possible designs toward a socially, environmentally, and economically feasible set of decisions. Geodesign is complex. There are multiple systems and geographic scopes and uncertainties. The geodesign methods should fit the context. Its technical support must be flexible, iterative, transparent, and rapid. Geodesign is collaborative. The natural language, the language in which it works, must be easily understood by all, and I mean by all. The geodesign endgame must support informed negotiation. The design will emerge. I've written about this for more than 30 years and done it a lot. And the book, A Framework for Geodesign, is basically questions. It's not answers. It's not a description of a methodology. It's a description of a workflow with questions that are inevitably being asked and guidance on how to find answers. The framework has six questions. Three of them deal with current state and past. Three of them deal with the future. Those are data, knowledge, and values. And there are three sets of questions in which the models associated with these questions have to pass. The why questions, where you understand what's going on. The how questions, where you decide how to work and the what, where, and when questions where you decide what to propose. They all have to have feedback, they all have to be able to change scale, and they all have to be making mistakes and knowing where you are. There is a workflow associated with, and it's a modeling workflow. I'm gonna demonstrate it through two projects. It has technical support. There are software programs which can support the work of geodesign, which is essentially using simple data and diagrams in very complicated ways by human people, not by artificial intelligence, and being able to interact with any other software of any complexity in any language. However, it shares conventions. It can be used in a commission which is a normal way of professional practice, but it has two real problems. The first is at the very left. How do you get many people to agree on what might happen and what should happen? And a group of people, scientists, designers, information people, making a design through many, many meetings and presenting it. And sometimes it's accepted and sometimes it's not. And when it's not, it's because some of the people making the decision have other ideas that didn't get studied. An alternative, very common in Europe, is to have a competition. And the competition might be among collective designs, and it might be to take different sets of priorities. It could be a competition inside a large company. And groups of people that are slightly different, or collaborating even, would be in different places, keeping their information private, proposing them, and a group of people who commissioned the study would say, that's the one we want. But they also can see then other ideas, and they may well want to choose other ideas and make their own or cause a new design to be made. And geodesign works in those ways, but it works better in open collaboration in which a group of people is brought in and they work on different ideas 
but nothing is private. And they go through a stage of informal negotiation by taking ideas that they see and using them, and then transferring into formal negotiations in which a design emerges. And the people who are making the decision and commissioning are part of the process in the ideal world. Why do this in a workshop format? And why do this in a workshop format even before you do a big data modeling study? Well, to explore strategic possibilities, to know what the questions really are, to identify the central issues, options, and choices, and to know what's really needed and wanted. This first study is commissioned by the uh, uh, Regional Commission of Sydney, Australia, and put together by Chris Pettit and his team at the University of New South Wales. It's basically looking at doubling the population of the oldest fully built out suburb of Sydney, Australia. Sydney's population is set to grow, double by 2050. They need about 360,000 new people and 180,000 additional dwellings in this area, a new transport system and a new uh, uh, transport as a service system. They wanna re reduce automobile usage double the university and act for a larger and more international population. And this is the estimated floor area ratio needed in that zone. The participants were the actual people making the design decisions in the real world. Sydney Water, Arabs, the Pat Randwick City Council, the Botanic Bay City Council, the Land and Housing Corporation, the City Commission, Transport New South Wales, the Department of Planning and several academics as associated with them. In other words, this is getting all the people who know each other but never work together in one room for two days, well prepared in advance. On day one, using the software called GeoDesign Hub, which is a product of Rishi Balal, who was a doctoral student at uh, CASA at the University College London of Mike Batty and myself. Introducing the problem, showing them the evaluation models, the attractiveness models for different land uses, and showing them how to make a diagram either by importing it or by drawing it. These are all knowledgeable people. By 1 p.m., we're making diagrams that are color-coded of policies and projects. Projects are solid colors, policies are dashed. These are objects. They have a cost, they have a time, they have a, a geography, and they have a time that it takes to do it. And by one o'clock that same day, with different objective sets and different sets of assumptions, we had six different client groups, resilience, housing, university, efficient public services, tourism, and compactness. They made their first design. And by five o'clock, they made their fifth or fourth or third design because it's really fast to work this way. And they could design in time and they could design in 3D. And that's the first design and look how different they are. And by the afternoon, by sharing ideas, they started to get closer and closer together. And on day two, in the morning at nine o'clock, each team presented its design and in the upper right, Everybody's design in every way was assessed on everybody's computer and they could start thinking about how would we negotiate among ourselves. And we organized in the afternoon a negotiation between two sets of three teams whose designs were most similar to each other or symbiotic with each other. And it was literally a negotiation. I'll take your project for housing if you take mine for commerce, for example. And starting at 3.30, we had the final negotiation in public between the final two designs with special tools that enable live instantaneous updating of the design by sharing of projects or dropping projects or adding them. Comparing system by system. And the last decision at five o'clock was where to locate the, the, one of the major new metro stations. And so at the end of two days, we had 
a design that was agreed to, a strategy to the year 2050. I need to move that. And we had it timed so that as the thing grew, its impact showed, its cost showed, and its project showed. As the thing was developed, the whole timing and budgets started out with a major public investment followed by major private investments, which turned down as it got down to 2050. That was two days work. That's the final proposal of where the zoning should be changed, where the green infrastructure should be remade, where the blue infrastructure should be made, and where new urban, industrial, and commercial development should go in the area. And finally, what should not be changed. Roderick Simpson is the commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission who caused this to happen. His last paragraph. The selection process and negotiation in the geodesign process could be considered a form of emergence, an idea that gains prominence. It is through the negotiation process and consensus where the geodesign process adds significant value. Now, how do we deal with this globally? In 2018, Tom Fisher, who's the former dean at Minnesota, Brian Orland, who I've known in this kind of work for, for 40 years, and I decided we were gonna start a global collaboration. This was January, 2018. We now have 220 university-based teams in 58 countries with 130 completed geodesign studies. That's not including private companies of which there are about 200 studies done already. These are the issues that we're dealing with, but we're dealing with them globally and regionally, and now nationally. We researched innovations that could be expected by 2050, and we found about 150 of them. All of them are on the internet as PowerPoint slides, citation with citations. We agreed on the following things in the collaboration. We would study as many of these systems as possible, water, agriculture, green infrastructure, energy, transport, industry, commerce, institutions, and housing, and two of your local choice. That we would, we would study at specific scales, in specific color codes, with specific time frames, and with scenarios that dealt with innovation or non-innovation, and we would use the sustainability goals of the UN to assess the schemes either by model or by judgment. An example, the National Infrastructure Commission of the United Kingdom proposes to add a million and a half people between Cambridge and Oxford to an existing population of 3 million. They want to establish a train link, re-establish a train link. It went bankrupt previously and a new highway. It's a real project. It's by the way, a 600 billion pound project. This is a beautiful place. There's no demand for travel from Oxford to Cambridge. Not really. The travel demand is local into London. It's a highly distributed area. There is no road. The railroad doesn't work. The high-speed train is not supposed to connect there. And there are lots of projects being proposed in the Greenbelt. In other words, this is a highly suspect government project. And the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, basically Mike Batty and I, we decided let's take this on as a project. So we organized it and we organized a group of about 20 of the consulting class, the people who are advising the local and national government and from the universities to a workshop. Off the record, this is an anonymous workshop of experts. There is no record of the people in it, except I know who they are. We prepared it using the national infrastructure assumptions about what they were thinking of and the variation of housing and Greenbelt policy. We prepared it for Geodesign Hub with very simple models. They're all in five groups, existing, inappropriate, capable, suitable, and feasible, immediately feasible. And we had cost data. We had innovation policies that were wanting to be dis discussed by these, con these consultants. On day one, we introduced the problem. We showed them what they would be doing. 
two iterations and two time frames in one day, and then negotiating with a partner toward a recommendation. In the morning, we made diagrams and we made designs that day. We showed them exactly the same technology in exactly the same framework. They produced, sorry, they produced about a hundred diagrams in about an hour. These are knowledgeable people. They are each objects to be combined in a design. You can see the housing patterns that were editable and editing. By the end of the day, they had made five designs in at least three or four um, iterations, updating, updating the evaluation models all the time with their impact assessments. And the next day they presented them and they negotiated toward a final design. And these were the three sub-final designs. The left one is the existing policies, building garden cities, a train which can't serve them because of the first mile, last mile problem. And on the far right, changing the housing policies to favor high densities supported by transit and a big national park and converting some of that land up there to controlled agriculture because the climate will be like the Netherlands. Why not be in the same vegetable industry as the Netherlands? And the SDGs get much better as you go into these innovative policies. And then they finally negotiated a recommendation which has its demands, it has its project scaled, it has its budget, and that's, that's a much better plan, a much better plan but it takes action now to think about it for the next 20 years, 30 years. Now we've got lots of these projects in the first two or three years of a collaboration. They're all in the same language. Across the top are urban expansion. In the middle are river recl reclamation projects. On the bottom are coastal zone projects. We've got a lot of these projects and we've started to compare them. The first book is the comparison of the first 50 projects. And there was clear variance in what was important. What was important was conservation, water policy, and housing first, then agriculture, transport, and energy second. In other words, energy and transport don't drive the system. They respond to the system. Secondly, there was systematic variance by latitude, climate, macro geography, and general level of economic development. In other words, similar climate, geography, and economic level produces similar priorities and ideas. But focusing on one global system or proposing one set of global policies and projects will not be workable. Regional and local variation will dominate decision-making, but systematically. Michele and I have been teaching faculty these relatively simple, human-oriented and technologically supported methods for the past two or three years. We've been teaching teachers, university academics. And that's one reason why this group is beginning to grow very, very fast. And in my opinion, it's these human technologically supported studies that are gonna cause much more appropriate systems modeling studies and still be understood by the governor, the prime minister, and the mayor, and the people who vote. And without those last people understanding the work, nothing will be done that will work. I'm not sure anything will be done anyway, but without working in the way that the human people understand it, we sure as hell are in the, for a very major set of emergency contexts in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. I think you managed in one shot to answer both sides of our main question. So considering uh, planning and design as a process, but also uh, as a verb, as you say, and as a noun. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the process- We're treating, we're treating it as a verb. We're treating it as a verb. Yeah, yeah but also the, the international yeah. journalism collaboration, I believe show also a way, possible way to introduce technology in, into the yeah. design. Oh. So, let me make a few a, a few comments because I know that I must leave at five o'clock. First of all, I really enjoyed listening to Stan. We're in a sense of the same generation coming from different. I mean, his mentor, Britton Harris. I know his work, but I discovered Britton Harris's work 
after I started mine. And my mentor was Kevin Lynch. That's, that's coming to the same perspective from two very different genealogies. And I, I respect that. I really do respect that. And we came, actually, my conclusion and Stan's conclusion of our talks were very, very similar. They really are if you listen to them again. Second comment. For the last 13 years, I've been a professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at UCL, Mike Batty's operation, which he no longer runs, but he's very active. This is, these are 30 postdocs and PhD students, all of whom deal with big data. All of them. There are five or six people in their 70s, I'm in my 80s, who have enormous experience. And the people with the enormous experience know that if you're gonna meet a mayor or a governor or a prime minister, and I've met all of these, you don't go with a regression analysis. You go with a map and a pen. Then you figure out what the regression analysis characteristics have to be. Because you're beginning to know what the problem might be. And so the idea, the idea that all these postdocs are working, what, what they're doing is they're building big data models to keep exactly the things that created the data going into the future. But if the conditions are going to change, the big data models are useless because the fundamental characteristics will change. So they're really good for short-term management. They're really important for that. But the further out you look and the more speculative you look, the less important they are. And the fundamentals are gonna be more important. And here's my last comment. What I see in the research group that I'm with at CASA is a focus on real short-term needs, real ones, public health. The movement of goods and services. Flooding. Those are real immediate problems. But, but, when we looked at the long-term 50, 2050 work from the first 50 projects in the collaboration, what we found was new issues were going to rise as being more important. One, the destruction of conservation as an idea. Two, water. Three, housing. Wars are going to be fought about food, water, conservation, and housing. They're not going to be fought about transportation. And they're going to be fought because a billion and a half people are going to be in places where they're not able to live anymore because they're not rich enough to desalinate water and pipe it from the ocean. Those are the problems. And if you really think, if you really think that today's big data models are going to be valid in 2050, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. And if you don't teach today's students, to think to 2050 and work backwards to tomorrow morning, you're also wrong academically. So the better problem is to let the students speculate and then analyze, rather than analyze and not speculate. That's my opinion. After teaching big projects for a long, long time, the students of mine who are doing important things were the best ones at not analyzing, but thinking ahead and finding people to do the analysis. I can name them. They run companies. And they are the people who the governor hires to figure out what the governor should do. There are not that many of them. But those are the people who are really the people we're missing globally. We're missing those people globally. And they don't need big data to do that. They don't want big data to do that. They just want time to think. And they're not stupid. They're really smart people. So I actually think, I actually think the problem is in the universities as much as in the governments. And I really think that that's why, that's why we, we created the collaboration. And it's open, it's free to be, 
to be part of it. You don't gain anything other than some tools at no cost. But, but, but the idea that Anna Clara can put together 12 schools or that Ljubljana University can have a national study, a regional study and local studies in the same language. Those are real changes in the academic schools. And that's what's needed. We really need to rethink the, the, teaching, the teaching structure of why we're teaching. And by the way, especially of our advanced students. It's very important. I, asked, I sat down with, with Kung Jan Yu, who's my former student, who's the Dean of Peking. He's the most, one of the most important landscape planners in the world. And we each said independently, we need 10,000 people in the next five to 10 years who can do a big project complexly and fast and do it in a public environment where people understand. And all we're doing now in most schools is producing specialists. The wrong thing. It's just the wrong thing. Thank you very much.